Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. What I think of obit writing is you're beholden to the facts. You can't change them. You can't exclude certain ones that may be unattractive, but you are allowed to try and make a good piece of art out of those facts. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, June Thomas. And I'm your other host, Kristen Meinzer. Kristen, it is such a blast to be talking with you today. You are one of my favorite podcast hosts from way back and always a lot of fun to chat with. But before we get lost in reverie, whose (laughs) voice did we hear at the top of the show? Well, before I tell you, I have to tell you, you are also one of my very favorite podcast hosts, and I'm Ah. so excited to talk with you today. But to answer your question... Marguerite Fox, storied New York Times obituary writer. That is who we're hearing from today on the show. And why did you want to speak with her? Well, I have always been fascinated with obituary writing. On the one hand, I know for a lot of people it can come off as kind of morbid. But on the other hand, it's also such noble work, you know, Mm. summing up what's important about a person's life, what's memorable about a person's life. Also, as a writer, I'm always just fascinated with how other writers do their job because, you know, every kind of writing is different, but also there's overlaps, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that is what we like to talk about here on Working. I'm super excited to hear that interview, but I don't know, something tells me that you probably have an extra segment exclusively for Slate Plus members. What will they hear? Oh, you know I do. So during our Slate Plus segment, we'll hear about some of the obituaries Margalit is most proud of writing, including ones that she believes played a role in correcting the public record, which I'm just going to say here now I agree with. They did play a very big role in doing that. Wow. Well, if you're a member of Slate Plus, you will hear that at the end of the episode. And if you aren't, I got to tell you, it's super easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you will get to hear extra segments on this show and others such as The Waves and Culture Gab Fest. You'll get bonus episodes of podcasts like Big Mood, Little Mood and Slow Burn. And of course, you will never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. All right, let's hear Kristen's conversation with Marguerite Fox. Marguerite Fox, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, I have to confess, I grew up very close with my grandmother, my nana, and like a lot of older people, my nana read obituaries pretty regularly, which meant I also read obituaries, especially celebrity obituaries. I'm curious, did you also grow up reading obituaries? No, I really didn't. And in the context of any American newsroom, probably any newsroom in the world, Obits are the beat that nobody thinks they want to do. Historically, they were kind of stigmatized. They were just for old people. And in a newspaper, the obit section was a kind of punitive Siberia. It was where you got sent if you'd messed up on a grown-up part of the paper. It was where they sent you to punish you. And so really until the last 20 years, 30 years, Nobody wanted to be an obit writer. The child has not been born who comes home from first grade clutching a theme (laughs) in his little hand that says, when I grow up, I want to write obituaries. Hasn't happened. (laughs) And yet, this is something that you did for years and years and years and did quite well. You're famous for it. You've been in a documentary about this. You've been interviewed many times about 
how great you are at this job. And it's an important job, in my opinion. I mean, you're essentially having the last word on somebody's life in the paper of record. That's what you have done for a living. How did you get into this business? Since you did not dream of doing this as a little child, how did you end up in this job? I'm guessing it's not because you were being punished. Hopefully not. Um, One never knows. (laughs) But what's interesting, before I answer that, and that has kind of a fun answer, there's one phrase I want to pick up on because it comes up quite reasonably again and again in discussions of obits, and that is the last word. Sometimes Mm. collections of obits are even titled the last word. Mm -hmm. I much prefer, and I suspect all my colleagues do, to think of news obits as the first word, because what Ooh. you're writing, what you're charged with writing as a journalist is the first leaf in the historical record. You have this extraordinary privilege and extraordinary pressure of producing the first assessment of a person's life that is entirely retrospective. So I think it'd be kind of cool for somebody to issue a collection of obits one day and call them the first word. Oh, I love that. Now, you asked how I got into it. I left graduate school, left a PhD program in linguistics when I'd grown up in an academic family where sort of it's it's a wonderful way to grow up, but also, frankly, very parochial and, and somewhat blinkered where everyone I knew was an academic. The friends of my parents were all academics. The parents of my friends were all academics. And so I kind of heedlessly started a PhD program many years ago. And after the first year, realized this isn't really what I want to be doing. But of course, I didn't know what I could do. All I could do, my only quote unquote marketable skills were I could read and I could write. So I went back from my program in California to New York and got a really uh, demoralizing but necessary low-level, entry-level job in book publishing. And when I was 30, went for a master's in journalism. So I entered the field late. Uh, About three years later, I caught on at the New York Times Book Review as a summer replacement on the Book Review copy desk. And like the man who came to dinner, uh, 24 years went by and I still hadn't left. (laughs) And the Book Review was a wonderful place to be. I spent 10 years there, but it was an editing job rather than the writing job I had trained for and now really wish to do. And fortunately, the obit department at the Times, as is true of any papers over department, had a pressing and chronic need for advance obits. As many of your listeners will know, big newspaper departments that have the staff to do this have many, many pre-written obits on file. The Times has, it's probably over about 2,000 now. And these are news obits that are completely reported and written, all obviously except for the where and the when of the death, because those things haven't happened yet. But they're for people whose careers and bodies of work are so long, so rich, and so complex that you don't want to get caught short as a reporter having to do their obit on deadline. Of course, you do sometimes because you can't plan for every contingency in the world. But because obit editors have this urgent, incessant, Sisyphean need to build up their stockpile of advance obits, they tap not only their own obit staff and Obit staffs are usually quite small, but they tap journalists from departments all over the paper. So if they want to do the advance obit of someone like Jerome Robbins, they would have asked one of our dance critics, and they want to do the advance obit of a famous businessman, they might have asked one of the people who cover that industry, cover Wall Street, and so it goes. So I started contributing advance obits for a range of people to the section on a freelance basis. I did this for something like nine years. And finally, in I joined the paper in 1994. Finally, in 2004, someone retired from the obit department. They posted the job. And because I had this track record by now, I was able to apply for the job and get it. Mm. Now, I'm curious, these advance obits, how old is the typical person or what stage in their life are they in when somebody on your obit team would start writing an obituary for them? There's no hard and fast actuarial rule. You know, very important people 
we might start looking at them when they hit their 80s. But again, that's not set in stone. Obviously, if we hear the news that a younger, newsworthy person has some sort of serious illness, the editor might tap one of the reporters, say, get something started just in case. The joke around probably all obit departments, certainly around ours, is the minute you hear that a prospective subject is poorly and you're ordered to drop everything and get a couple of thousand words in the can, no sooner do you do that than they rally and live another 10 or 20 years. (laughs) Has that happened to you where you've written obituaries for people who, you know, were thought to be on their deathbed and they're still around? Oh, yes. And it happens to all of us. The subject for the very first advance of it I ever wrote back in 1995 when I was on the Times Book Review and trying to work my way into a writing job. I'm not allowed to say who it is. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Um, Don't kill me without writing an obit first, please. Fair enough. Uh, But (laughs) were I to do that, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Well, actually, I would, but that's another part of the conversation for later. I might actually sit down with you and interview you during your lifetime. (gasps) But apropos of your other question, the subject of the very first advance obit I ever wrote, he's a major, major, major American scholar and intellectual. I wrote it back in 1995. This person is still alive and damn him, he's still fiendishly productive. So you do, that's the other thing (laughs) with advances. You have to monitor what your subject is doing and make sure your advance is up to date. So if someone has a new movie out or a new book out or has a new controversy that's made headlines, you need to go in and update the advance. And is it your job to stay on top of every obit you've written and then update it yourself? Uh, How do you keep track of all these? Because I imagine you must have dozens, if not hundreds of them, still in the can waiting to come out, right? That's right. Dozens at this point. When I took early retirement in 2018 to pursue really a a very old dream of writing books full-time, which I have been doing ever since, I left in the can probably between 70 and 80 advance obits for, you know, people in a range of occupations, a range of ages, mostly older, of course. And when these obits run is, needless to say, in the lap of the gods. But on average, I have between half a dozen and a dozen bylines in the year. And happily, because I'm no longer employed by the Times, if the editors reading it down one last time have questions They'll call me, and of course, I will do the edit with them, answer questions. But in terms of, as we say in the trade, putting a top on the obit, which means when we hear the news that someone has actually died, calling the family, calling a reliable source, getting the where and the when and the how old and the list of survivor names, one of my colleagues, one of my former colleagues, will now do that. Mm. And I'm curious what qualifies somebody for an official obituary written by the paper of record? Are there certain, you know, boxes that you have to check in order to get that honor? There is no single template, nor should there be. And we're proud to say that each case is very seriously deliberated on and discussed on a case-by-case basis. For myself, my kind of litmus, my mantra was, did this person change the culture? And that can have a whole range of possibilities from very obvious ones like um, a president, a senator, a Supreme Court justice, a movie star, to less obvious ones. The And these are the ones obit writers love best. These wonderful men and women who, despite not being household names, did something, invented something, had an idea that, as I like to think of it, put a wrinkle in the social fabric. And it's the wrinkle, if not the person who put it there, that everyone is aware of. I and my colleagues did many of these kinds of things. I had the great privilege and and fun, if you should pardon the expression in this context, of doing obits for the inventor of the Frisbee, the inventor of 
Etch-a-Sketch, the inventor of the pink plastic lawn flamingo. And <laughs> God bless the times because he had literally, for better or worse, depending on your view, changed the landscape of mid-century suburban America. The Times put him on page one, you know, with this glorious picture of him in a flamingo patterned Hawaiian shirt standing in a field full of plastic flamingos. Uh, I had the privilege of doing a woman who was, again, her name was Ruth Seams, S-I-E-M-S, who was a home economist at one of the big food companies in the Midwest. It was either General Foods or General Mills, I forget which. And she invented a product whose name on its patent application was, well, fittingly, very dry. It was something like, you know, dehydrated, rehydratable bread product. What she'd invented was stovetop stuffing. And mm. she had the good grace to die in November. And we ran her obit Thanksgiving week. We'll be back with more of Kristen Mines' conversation with Marguerite Fox. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity. Much like how their progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favourite podcast listening activities. Like going on a road trip, cooking dinner and even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. If you like using debit over credit, don't you think it's time to also get rewarded? Well, now you can with Discover Cashback Debit. It's a checking account that rewards everyone with cashback on everyday purchases. Plus, you're not charged any account fees, period. Whether you're moving, starting a new job or headed into that next stage of life, whatever it is, Discover Cashback Debit is for everyone. Check out eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we discuss creative advice and talk about creative processes. And we would love to hear your questions. What's confounding you? What's confusing you? What is just giving you creative hives? Let us know so that we can try to help you. You can drop us a line at workingatslate.com or you could send a voice memo to that address. You can also give us a ring at 304-933-WORK and leave a voicemail. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now let's return to Kristen's conversation with Marguerite Fox. Now, I I will confess I'm not obviously by any means one iota as uh, experienced as you with writing obituaries, but unfortunately, I have had to contribute to writing obituaries for family members over the years. And I'm curious about how you see what you do as different from what people like I do when we're writing obituaries for loved ones. Right. Often... Um for the most part, with a you know a major paper that has the reach of a New York Times, a Washington Post, an LA Times, by definition, most of the people whose obits you're writing have been movers and shakers in the world. They've been in politics, they've been on the silver screen, and so they're used to being in public life, and their families 
understand what it is journalists do. But sometimes with some of these unknown backstage players that change the world, they've hardly ever been in the press, unbelievably. And so you have to gently but firmly explain to some families, not all, the difference between a eulogy and a news of it. And we say a eulogy, which can also appear in sort of regional papers, local papers. We say those we leave to the ministers and the rabbis. And what we are doing is a news story reported, balanced, warts and all, as is any other article in the paper. And that, in a nutshell, is the difference between the eulogistic obit that comes from either the funeral home or the family, where it seems that everyone that died in that town was a saint, and they always died either doing what they loved, surrounded by their adoring family, or both. And those kind of Victorian cliches for us just are right on the cutting room floor from the very beginning. Mm. Now, this leads me to an obituary of yours that was published a few months ago, And it was one that I just admired how well written it was, how well researched, how you managed to stay balanced. But I personally would have had the hardest time not inserting my own distaste for the subject into this. And I'm speaking of your obituary of Carolyn Bryant Dunham, the woman who accused 14-year-old Emmett Till of flirting with her and or grabbing her by the waist and or whistling at her. She supposedly later told a historian that Till had done none of the above. But by that point, of course, her husband and brother-in-law had already tortured and murdered him in America's most infamous, I would say, lynching incident. I personally, like I said, I would have had such a hard time writing that without the most poison pen. How did you approach that task? That that obituary was, oh, I'm just, <laughs> it, it was incredible. So h- how did you do that balancing act? Thank you. That, uh, needless to say, was one where my gut was in a knot, you know, frankly, dreading the day it would run because I knew there'd be all kinds of opprobrium. And there was actually very little. And I think it was because, thank goodness, as you were kind enough to say, I was able to write it in a very detached way. You have to be, without uh, my meaning to imply that there's clinical coldness, you have to have professional distance just as a doctor or a therapist would. My oldest childhood friend said it best. She has degrees both in journalism and then she went on and got a master's in counseling. And she had the brilliant observation that the two fields are exactly the same when it comes to getting people comfortable enough with you to divulge all sorts of things, where they diverge diametrically, of course, is what do you do with the information once you have it. Now, with Carolyn Bryant, I didn't interview her. She was already old, infirm. Um, you know, her family wouldn't let journalists anywhere near her from everything I had read. So I did it from the clips. I interviewed around her. Of course, at the Times, many editors read your copy down before you file an advance obit. They make suggestions. You make appropriate changes. Um, So in a sense, the reporting for that was no different. And you really do have to not let your feelings intrude and just write in a very detached way. Uh, Another example just as horrific in a different way. Uh, few, this ran a few years ago. Again, one of the advances I'd done was for Charles Manson. Well, there's nothing good you can say about somebody like mm-hmm. that. So again, you just let the facts speak for themselves. And indeed, when you do write about one of history's great villains, and we've all had to write about Nazi war criminals, enforcers of segregation in the Jim Crow South. I did one of the obits I did years ago was for Sheriff Jim Clark, the you know great bald colossus in Alabama who was clubbing people on the head as they came across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You just write it coolly. You let the facts speak for themselves. If someone is inarguably one of history's villains. You let his resume and his quotes and his facts hang him in and of themselves. And then you 
go home and you take a shower and you have a good stiff drink to just wash that person off you. That's all you can do. Mm. Yeah, because you're still a human being. You can't just, even with all of your detachment, I like that at the end, you have to take care of yourself too, as the right. obituary writer too, as a human, which is true of a lot of creative fields. It's not just the end product you make, it's you as a human that you're bringing to the table. That's right. And as a journalist, you, of course, you are paid to be a disinterested in the traditional meaning of the term, a disinterested presence that is detached on the outside looking in. If I were uh, either a critic or a columnist, then I'd be paid to express opinion. But as a reporter, I am simply paid to have no opinion and answer the most essential question that is the raison d'etre for any news story in any paper, to answer the question, what happened? Now, you've mentioned a few times interviewing your subjects. When you have interviewed subjects over the years, did you let them know up front this is going to be for an obituary or were these interviews being conducted for other parts of the paper and you knew that eventually they would contribute to their obituary? How did that work? Well, you can't dissemble. But on the other hand, there is no Emily Post for the most bizarre social situation in the world. If you break it down, what you're really doing is you're cold calling a stranger. You're saying, hi, I'm Fox of the Times. We've never met but I know you're kind of getting long in the tooth and <laughs> you might die, maybe soon, hopefully not. And I want to ask you some probing questions, maybe difficult questions. And then when the time comes, I'm going to put your answers where a million people can see them. There's no etiquette for that. So I take a leaf from the Times' great mid-century obit writer, Alden Whitman, who was famous for sitting down with his subjects during their lifetime. And he did, you know, the obits of amazing, accomplished people. Uh, Helen Keller was one that comes to mind, but they were, they were balanced. He, you know, he was a, a good newsman. And he had a euphemism that has stood us all in great stead down the generations, which is you call someone, you introduce yourself, and you say, we're updating your biographical file. Would you consent to an interview? And then you say, you have our word of honor that everything and anything you tell us will be embargoed during your lifetime. So then, oh. first of all, people get what it's for. And second of all, sometimes, not always, but sometimes it encourages people to be really forthcoming. Now, that strategy can have unintended consequences. I once had to call a woman who was already well into her 90s, and she was the textbook example of one of these unsung backstage players. She'd invented something that every single American over a certain age knows or had or has seen. And I can't tell you what it is because, bless her, she is still alive. And so that obit is <laughs> sitting in the can. She must be in her late 90s by now, almost 100. So when, you know, somebody that age, I wanted to be particularly delicate. I called her, said, this is Fox of the Times. I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes. We're updating your biographical file. And this 95-year-old lady chirped gaily, oh, you mean you're writing my obituary. And she was delighted. <laughs> so you never know how people are going to react. Well, the idea of somebody at the New York Times planning your obituary means that you must be pretty important if the Times thinks you're worthy of writing about on, you know, upon your death. That's right. And of course, people <laughs> in public life just, you know, are accustomed to it. But um, you never know quite what response you're going to elicit when you cold call a family. Usually they're pleased. The families of these people that haven't been in, in the press a lot, they may not know the term newsworthiness, but they, they're very cognizant of it in other ways. They'll say, we're so gratified that you think our mother, father, uncle, aunt, is deserving of an obit in your pages. Mm. Now, shifting a bit to craft here, what is the structure of an obituary? Well, the obit, I think, is m the most formulaic genre in any daily paper. It has a lot of boilerplate. And so in the old days, it was this clunky 
Latin lead that basically, you know, it was like doing Mad Libs. It was John Doe, comma, who did X, Y, and Z, comma, died yesterday in such and such a place. He was such and such an age. The cause was such and such. So it was so formulaic, and I think that contributed to the reason that most reporters didn't want to do obits for a really long time, because it was just sagging under the weight of all of this leaden stuff. One of the really wonderful things that my longtime boss and still the Times obit editor, Bill McDonald, instituted was where appropriate to use more feature-like leads. And it again, that has to be discussed on a case-by-case basis. You wouldn't use a feature lead for you know, a president or a senator. But again, for one of these unsung heroes or heroines, you might. So again, for the man who invented the plastic lawn flamingo, that screams for a feature lead. And I was able to use one. And there it was on page one. And you get to the facts of the death, of course, when you can. Uh, same thing at the bottom end of the story. Historically, all obits used to end with survivors. And so there'd be, if somebody was prolific, there'd be this long list of children's names, the towns where they lived, the grandchildren. And it was just like a cement block weighing down the piece. Now we try to tuck the survivors in higher up and have, you know, again, the kind of last paragraph, the kicker, as we say, that you might have on a lively news feature. So the great art of doing an obit in the 21st century, thanks to people like Bill McDonald and his predecessor, Chuck Strum, his predecessor, Marvin Siegel, all of whom I had the privilege of writing for, is you need a news obit to continue to do the work of an obit, to say the date and place of death, the cause of death, the age, survivors are in there somewhere. And of course, why this person was important and newsworthy, you have to provide the reader with all of that. But you don't want it to read like one of these ponderous leaden obits from days of old. That's the difference. Mm. Now, I personally, in my own writing, find that structure, confines, borders, when I'm writing within those things, I personally find they give me the freedom to be more creative. I know everybody's different out there. But for me, it somehow helps me to know that I can do anything I want to within this shape or space versus just working within no shape or space whatsoever. Have you found the same applies to obituary writing for you? What I think of obit writing now as, and really all nonfiction writing, is you're beholden to the facts. You're an artist. The facts are your found objects. You can't change them. You can't exclude certain ones that may be unattractive. You have to use them all because that's part of your obligation to the reader and to the story and to the truth. But you are allowed in ways that we weren't years ago to try and make a good piece of art out of those facts. You are writing books full time now. You, you, you've you been writing books for years, but now you write them full time. Do you ever find yourself enlisting specific skills from obituary writing when you're writing your books? Every hour of every day. I wrote my first three narrative nonfiction books when I was working full-time at the paper, which meant I had no weekends, no vacation time, no social life, and was really exhausted. But it got me to the point where I could very cautiously step away from newspaper work in 2018 and write books full time. And so now the uh, time it's taken for me to produce a book has been shaved down from five or six years to two or three, which is nice. So I have a very happy existence of sitting. I usually, because my books are heavy research nonfiction, I'll spend the first year or year and a half just reading the background literature before I even touch the keyboard. So I'll have my coffee at my elbow my cat on my lap. If I'm reading a paperback, the cat will be an obliging book stand. (laughs) And indeed, I came to the realization that 
the structural obligations that one has to meet for a daily paper, the classic inverted pyramid that they teach you about in journalism school, give the broad-based information first, then the more expendable, more colorful stuff down and down and down. So the pyramid is getting narrower and narrower in terms of information content. All of that, all you have to do is take that structure of a thousand word daily news feature, grid it up a hundred times and you've got a hundred thousand word book. So it's, I never thought that the skills of daily newspapering would translate as well to writing books as they turn out to do. Mm. So all of the aspiring book writers out there listening right now perhaps should dabble in writing obituaries for a while? Or any daily news story. There are two things I say to young journalists because these are the two things that have helped me the most. Even if you want to do long form, which I always thought I wanted to do, and I think um, writers come into the world hardwired for either long form or short form. And I'm a long form writer in my bones. It's what I like to read best. It's what I like to write best. Never in a million years did I expect to spend 24 years on a daily newspaper, but it was the best training, better than anything I could have conceived or constructed for myself. So yes, even if you want to do long form kids, spend time on a daily paper. And the other thing is read a lot of poetry really good poetry, you know, E.E. Cummings, Dylan Thomas, people who experiment with language, but in ways that are really in the service of the work, nothing gratuitous there, and music. My original training was as a cellist, and that, again, not something I expected. It has been absolute godsend when it comes to writing, because music, of course, gives you the sense of tone and cadence, and color, and pacing. And all of those words, of course, apply equally well to writing prose as to playing music. Margalit Fox, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fantastic. You're very welcome. Up next, Kristen and I will discuss the art of cold calling sources. I'm shivering just at the thought of it. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Big box retailers led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a bill in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. Senate Bill 1838 would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, visit handsoffmyrewards.com and tell them to oppose credit card routing legislation paid for by the Electronic Payments Coalition. Kristen, that was amazing. I (laughs) literally had chills at several points in that interview. First of all, Marguerite, or Fox of the Times, as I will now forever (laughs) think of her. She's just an amazing talker, right? Truly one of those people I could listen to all day. But she also got me thinking about some, I think, quite profound questions. So thank you for that. Oh, no. All thanks goes to her. Uh, Schnauzer could have been interviewing her and done just as well because she's just such a beautiful talker. (laughs) Well, it's very clear that to her, obit writing is, first of all, journalism. She held that assignment to the same standards as any other piece she might write for The Times, and she approached it in the same way, doing reporting, research, fact-checking, writing with as much verve and style as was appropriate to the subject. But Kristen... Those calls to update a recipient's biographical files, like, yeah, that's a great way of putting it, like that (laughs) would calm people down. But just hearing about 
making those calls. It kind of made me perspire. I have to admit that I hate making cold calls, but I also know that it's something that journalists just have to do sometimes. Not just journalists either, people who write books or reports or make documentaries. You, I know, as an experienced journalist, have done this a ton of times. So do you have any tips for making those calls? I have made thousands of these kinds of calls over the course of my career, more than I could possibly count. Um, There were some days where I'd be making 30 phone calls a day or sending 50 emails. So it's absolutely been a part of my job. But, you know, I went in to every phone call, especially in the early days of my career when I was nervous, giving myself a pep talk and reminding myself, I'm not here to pester anybody. I'm not here to be predatory. I'm not trying to ask for money. I'm not trying to sell these people anything. I'm trying to be of service by giving voice to people's stories, by trying to get their experiences or their knowledge out there. And it's a huge gift to be able to hear people's stories. And yes, I am asking for that gift, but I'm also giving them a gift in a return, which is giving them the platform to do that. And so I like to go in that way, thinking I'm here to be of service and there's nothing to feel awkward about. At this point, I don't even really think about it. But like I said, in those early days, especially, I'd have to give myself that pep talk and say, I'm here to be of service. I'm here to help you get your story out there. Wow. It's very hard to argue with that. And um, I don't have to do it much anymore, but I think that would have helped me. Um, I just want to note, though, that there is this one thing to cold call someone for a news story. You know, something happened, they have insight, sharing it would help other people understand the importance and nuance of what's going on. But what about for features or for narrative podcasts, which I know is something you've also done a lot of? There you're asking for potentially a lot of time for people to relive things that may be painful, may not, but they may be, to share in a way that might expose them to criticism. What do you say to those people when you're seeking their cooperation as a source? Yeah, well, I remind them that everything we're recording is being taped. It's not being put out there live into the world, mm-hmm. at least not at this point in my career. I did work in live radio for six and a half years, and that was that was a different story. Yeah. Back then, I would remind people, like, this segment is only six minutes long. It's okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it was live news. Um, yeah. But for the longer form interviews that I do nowadays that can be up to an hour long for some of the podcasts that I host, I remind them this is taped. If you need to take a moment, if you need to collect yourself, if you need to have a glass of water, um, if you even need to cry, which has happened sometimes when I've been interviewing people, I remind them that they have the space to do that. This is being taped. We can edit out certain things later. And because this is a feature piece, this is not hard journalism. We're not going to try and crack you open like a nut. This is Mm. really a chance to offer perspective and uh, hopefully to make other people out there understand something a little bit better. And I always add, you might also help people feel less alone. And Mm. helping people feel less alone is something that I think we all can understand because who hasn't felt alone at certain times? And reminding people I'm talking to of that aspect of things can really you know, shift their thinking and make them feel like, yes, this is a great thing for me to do if I can make people feel less alone. And above all, I always try to bring gratitude to the table. I never try to bully anyone into it. If they say yes, I am endlessly thankful. And I tell them how thankful I am. And I know what a gift it is that they're talking to me. Mm. I was really struck by Marguerite's story of growing up in a world where basically everyone she knew, her family, her family friends, everyone almost was an academic. So she started down that path, but she then did something I'm always in awe of, which is to realize, you know what, this isn't for me. And so she went off and found another career track. Kristen, you and I go back a bit, so I know that, like me, you're a first-generation college graduate, which often means that there isn't a default option to follow. But I'm curious what you say to young people, or to anyone for that matter, who asks you if you would recommend the life of a journalist or writer or podcaster or all the many things you do. What do you tell them? Well, I first and foremost make clear 
you don't go into this work because you want to be rich. This is not <laughs> a job you do because you want a lot of money. So Word. Let, let, let's say that like me and like you, June, let's say you come from a more working class background. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, you know, break through to the next level economically, this isn't necessarily the field that's going to do it. My uncle, who is a bricklayer, makes at least 10 times more money than I do. So <laughs> yeah. that's just like the facts. Mm -hmm. But it can be such great work. I am so lucky. People tell me their stories. I get to dig in deep with things that I'm fascinated about. I mean, and I consider that a privilege, the fact that that is part of my job. I'm curious about something. I spend days, if not weeks, learning about that thing. That is a gift, and it's something I enjoy immensely. And so that's what I'm clear with people about. I'm doing it because I love it. I'm not doing it to become rich. I'm not doing it because people love me, because frequently they disagree with me, to be frank. A lot of the <laughs> things that I write or that I podcast about, not everyone's going to agree with. You know, read some reviews of mine. Some people love what I do. Some people hate it. It's also not a field you go into because you want everyone to pat you on the back all the time. <laughs> true, true. Look at this. Yes. You know, it was something you said then really resonated with me. Like, if you are a curious person, which if you're not, don't bother going into journalism. But if you <laughs> are, you actually get paid to kind of sate your curiosity. Like, yes. sometimes, um, you know, I wonder, okay, what do people who have other kinds of jobs, like, how do they get to, uh, you know, go solve these problems or just answer their own questions? Because they've got to work for a living. For me, this is my work. So, like, I get to do that. But <laughs> it must be very frustrating. Um I want to end our conversation this week by picking up where you began the interview, talking about how you grew up spending a lot of time with your grandmother, who was a keen reader of the obits. And I'm curious if you think that experience in any way shaped your future career. And since it feels weird to ask if you have a favorite obit, I'll ask instead if there's one that always stayed with you. First of all, your first question, did reading all those obits with my Nana, did that affect the path I took in life? I absolutely think the answer is yes. And uh -huh. I didn't say this to Marguerite, but I'll say this to you and the other listeners. A lot of the obits we were reading were not in the New York Times mm -hmm. or in storied <laughs> publications like that. They were in right. the National Enquirer or People or you know, celebrity rags. And <laughs> above all, you know, I wear a lot of hats, but above all, I consider myself a culture critic. And would I become a culture critic? Would I be who I am today if it weren't all of those many hours reading those celebrity rags with my <laughs> Nana? I don't think so. Um, would I be so invested in reporting on the royals, for example, if it weren't for learning about who Grace Kelly was through her obituary in People magazine? And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I learned so much about old Hollywood. I learned so much about royalty. I learned so much about what it means to be famous mm -hmm. through those publications I read with my Nana. And so mm -hmm. I don't think I'd be where I am now if it weren't for that groundwork that was laid early. <laughs> some I suspected might, as much. Yeah. Some people might say like, oh, there's nothing good that comes out of those rags. And I totally mm -hmm. know where they're coming from. I, I even host a podcast called The Daily Fail, which is just essentially making making fun of those rags. But I feel like the reason I'm able to make fun of them is because I am so well versed in them. I'm not just coming yes. in from nowhere to make fun of them. It's coming from that place where I read them every day with my Nana growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, uh, I'll just call it a favorite obit. Which one has stuck with you the longest? Oh my gosh. It's hard to choose just one, but I'm going to name one that's pretty in the grand scheme of my life pretty recent. It's less than 10 years old. It was from the City Pages, which is a free weekly newspaper that I believe toward the end of its life was owned by the same folks as the Village Voice. Mm -hmm. And they ran a front cover obituary on Prince when he died. And of course, it was incredibly moving because Prince was the hometown hero of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. where I'm from. And mm -hmm. as a Minneapolis person, to see that kind of tribute in his hometown paper, in the hometown alternative paper, not the mainstream mm -hmm. press, but the place that was covering him when he was just coming up, when he was not a megastar yet, when he was playing small shows. And their obituary was essentially just a tribute to mm -hmm. how important he was to the town 
and what his life was like, not just during the sparkly points, but who he was as a person, as a local resident. Oh, my goodness. I want to go find that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. That way you will never miss an episode, which you don't want to do. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like Decoder Ring and Big Mood, Little Mood, and you'll never hit a paywall at Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. June. Thank you so much for this great conversation. And thank you to Margalit Fox, our guest this week. And thank you to our amazing producer, Cameron Drews. We'll be back next week with June's conversation with writer Katherine Howe. Until then, get back to work. It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at PenFed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers' funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.